uh, anybody who says he or she is ideologically uh, uh, opposed to any intervention is lying. I mean, remember, ideologically uh, opposed, but our whole process of living itself imposes a interference. So the question is the degree of interference. Now, there can be a lot of debate about what should be the degree of interference and everybody will have a different position on that. Okay. So now the real thing is, how do we build consensus in society on that degree? And say, particularly in this case of say a, a river, how much of the water to use and how much to let go, suppose. There's a very basic question in the, uh, uh, when you talk about say environmental flows in a river, that's a basic question. How much water can possibly be extracted and how much water should be allowed to flow in the river? And there is no one answer to that. There are many answers. So I think the key challenge is how to arrive at that answer in a way that it sort of, you know, guards the interests of everybody, including the weaker sections and at the same time, hmm? yeah, and future generations. Now, so therefore, it's not a, I think the process is equally important in that and there is no one answer, I cannot give one answer. I can give my personal answer, but that's of course a different thing. Okay, so, but I think at least the recognition that we need to evolve a process that will lead to that, I think is important. So, uh, so what I am saying here that, the expanded, uh, the, the notion of environmental flows, which actually sort of formalizes many things which have been said by communities and by people and by environmentalists and by even many water resource engineers over the years, uh, talks, I, I, I mean, I think uh, creates the need to re-examine this whole notion of surplus. And I think that's, if we do that, then this whole nature of how the uh, river linking project will look will be very different. Because the whole surplus available will change significantly. So, Again, a little digression, though this time into the issue of environmental flows. So, um, just to highlight few things, again, it may seem to be a very basic thing, but I just thought that maybe uh, it's good to reiterate that some people may or may not be familiar with it. So, uh, when you talk about environmental flows, what are the concepts? I mean, what is the basic concept? So, this is a quote, this is not my quote, this is from some, uh, one of the sort of... Uh, key leaders of think thinkers or whatever, writers or scientists on environmental flows, the full range of natural intra and inter annual variation in hydrological regimes and associated characteristics of timing, duration, frequency and rate of change are critical in sustaining the full native biodiversity and integrity of the aquatic ecosystem. Now, what does it mean in short? It means that when we talk about environmental flows, it's not only about the quantity of water. The flow in the river is not just quantity. It's basically also the natural variations. In fact, it is, otherwise, you know, normally people talk about, that's why that notion of minimum flows which came, said that some minimum flow should be let go and that's enough. But it's not just the quantity. The flow in a natural river, or actually when I say river, I mean river basin, I also mean some of the water bodies in the river. But I'm just using river as a sort of a short this thing. The flow in the river has a lot of natural variations. And those variations are very important. Those variations, both within the year, lean season, uh, uh, monsoon season, other seasons, and across years, high flood, low flood, dry year, form, play a very important role because the whole river ecology, and in fact the whole river community and cultures around, along that river have evolved to be in alignment with that flow. So flow variation is the characteristic and all important parameter in defining river ecology, this person of course talks about only biodiversity because it's from a western source, but in the Indian context, river ecology, livelihoods and life, the flow variation is very critical. And therefore the question comes, as we will see, whether really any flow is surplus and to, you know, what way. So let's look at this, this is a flow chart of flow in the Lohit river in Arunachal Pradesh. One of the uh, yet, as yet free flowing river, but where some seven, eight dams are proposed. So this is a 10 day flow at the Demway dam site. So, you can see there is a very, so this year, 87, 88, 89, so in each year. So, with, within the year, there is a variation and then across the years also, there is a variation. And you see, maybe the lowest flow is around 300 or 250 and the highest flow is about 3,500 or something like that. So, there is a variation of about 10 to 12 times that. Okay. Now, similarly, you will find similar sort of flow variations in, so that's a Himalayan river. Okay, that's why I gave that and this is Mahanadi which is just below the Hasdev Mango Sangam. So this is a peninsular river. Again, you can see the big variations. Uh, this is a, uh, I don't know how many years, it's a 10 year series again. And here you can see the variation is 
much higher much higher so these are the this thing now the important point is each of these are playing some role so you have uh, you know if you look at that uh, i think that graph was not seen so this is again now i have borrowed this slide so typically you will have different elements in the flow extremely low flows low flows high pulses small floods large floods i mean that graph is not seen properly so they are all different elements of the flow in a river and they are each of them are playing some very specific roles and functions okay now again this may be very basic and known but i just want to highlight it so that uh, we need to learn to look at flows from a much larger and much different perspective uh, so uh, just to come back to that lohit so this is the brahmaputra plains one part of the brahmaputra plains the lohit incidentally is one of the three rivers which meets to form the brahmaputra so lohit is this is of course far downstream of lohit but so typically this is a low flow season for brahmaputra and when it's high flood it will expand but if you look at these places okay in the river sort of bed these are areas where there is cultivation going on there is grazing going on Now, how is that possible when the river flood expands when the river floods and expands that it carries water and silt there and then deposits that so there is enough moisture and there is enough nutrients there and this is typically there for you know so that so the high floods are they surplus or what they are bringing they are playing a particular role similarly if you look at uh, mahanadi so this is actually hasdev this is not mahanadi but hasdev is a tributary of mahanadi again the same thing i mean you see the extent of the river bed again the high floods will bring water spread the water and uh, then you know that creates all the sand uh, farming i mean the watermelon crops and all that the river bed farming watermelons and other crops and uh, of course lot of grazing also it supports lot of cattle so this is the kind so these are only some of the uh, again this is a borrowed slide so there are only some of the functions which are more visible to us which are performed by different flows the high flows perform certain functions but there are others for example i think you had mentioned that uh, there is a channel carving function so the the river channel the creation of the river channel and maintenance of the river channel is done by high floods so if you look at the high floods the channel forming the channel which defines the river biodiversity the nature of the channel that is formed by high floods in fact and some of those you know very big floods which come once in 10 or 20 years actually cleans up the debris and so they perform very important functions now uh there are other functions for example a slightly high flood before the monsoon gives the trigger to some of the fish to spawn that uh, that is a time to spawn now now if that flood is dis taken away by some other reason the the fish don't get the uh, trigger to spawn so they don't spawn so there are many kinds of things linked so you know there are uh, uh, the dispersal of plant seeds within that so there are many functions i won't go into all that so let's so these are the sort of sets of functions which the different flows perform and uh that is why uh when we very many we cannot very easily talk about the notion of a surplus so the point that i want to make and come back to is that with this kind of understanding uh, available in a more formalized and scientific manner now available to us which was also earlier there as a part of more say informal understanding we also have this now which is into an emerging science and a principle of understanding the different roles played by different aspects of the river flow and that includes not just water but also sediments that has to be used to come back and redefine this concept of surplus what is what do we mean by surplus and what is the surplus and then have a more realistic assessment of what will mean if that surplus is to be diverted so that is not unfortunately done anywhere in this project but the point that i am trying to make here is that uh, basically first of all we need to have a much more deeper and broader understanding of what the river and its flows are actually doing or have been supposed to be doing before the, there was some natural intervention because without that baseline the whole notion of surplus itself is a problematic thing because then that surplus is as somebody was saying aapne bataya tha shayad ki wo sirf teen cheeze dekhte hain agriculture industry and domestic needs so coming back to this uh, river linking project looking at this through this apart from something apart from the mistaken notion of surplus there is no defi proper definition even if they had sort of said you know that this is our definition but this is how we define 
how surplus will be calculated, how deficit will be seen, they have not done anything of that. Though, as uh, she has pointed out, the project documents where they sort of show how much water is to be uh, taken out, they talk about these three needs, agriculture, industry and domestic. Again, how do they define ki how many industries we will have all that, that all is not said. So, their, even their basic assumptions are not laid out. No proper definition of surplus. Surplus estimated only for these few needs, as I mentioned. Um, the needs of river ecology, community livelihood, etc. not considered. So, that is what we have been talking about for the last few things that once you incorporate those, it will look quite different. Um, the irrigation needs, that is what they say is the maximum possible irrigation in that basin is assessed only on the basis of large dam systems. The whole role that can be possibly played by decentralized rainwater harvesting potential like all those things are not considered. So, what you have here is a gigantic scheme which is based on a completely wrong notion of surplus and this thing which needs to be completely re-looked and you know the whole paradigm needs to be shifted. We need to completely redefine this notion of surplus. Plus apart from that you know all these other problems are there. And uh, then of course even if it is done as it is this thing there will be huge large number of dams and canals and tunnels to be built which will have series of their own impacts. Uh, Sandarp, that is uh, South Asia Network on Dams, Rivers and People, they estimate that about 78 dams and barrages would need to be built. So, we can imagine all that. There will be huge social and environmental impacts. I am not getting into these what these impacts are. I think uh, time also may not permit. Uh, particularly downstream impacts from where the flows are going to be diverted, very serious impacts. Uh, there will be very high lifts, uh, almost uh, uh, up to 120 meters from at different places where you need to lift the water in many of these projects. So, that will be uh, large amounts of power will be used. A huge financial costs, the figures keep you know changing, but uh, these are mind boggling figures. Uh, there are many interstate issues as many of the rivers are interstate, so two states fighting over each other. So, it is not so easy to get this project through. There are also transboundary issues as I mentioned, uh, international issues because they require dams in Nepal and Bhutan. And I think probably the last and most important thing is that all this is diverting attention from the real solutions to the water problem, to the irrigation, to issues of equity, to issues of uh, uh, you know uh, sustainability which is there. So, we are again getting lost into trying to stop, stop something which is destructive and you know uh, uh, are not you know using our energies to move something that can be uh, more equitable, more sustainable. 